Now, uh, this is uh, not only a course for English majors, uh, but for other majors too. The poets will be reading, well, they, uh, they knew about science, music, politics, economics, and they presume to talk about those things <coughs> uh, in their poetry and out of their poetry too. Uh, my lectures uh, are going to presume no special knowledge uh, on your part. Uh, I, uh, I see this as uh, a course that's an introduction to uh, the literature of a period, uh, to modern poetry. Uh, the, uh, uh, we'll be studying several poets in some detail. Um, uh, the uh, presumption is, well, that they, they all uh, reward and, and demand a certain amount of, of close reading. Uh, at the same time, I do mean to uh, give you some sense of the, the period in which they're writing, uh, of some sense of modernism as, uh, as a field, um, as, as one of the richest fields in, in English language writing. Uh, finally, though, uh, this really is a course in poetry, uh, plain and simple. I mean to uh, introduce you to particular poems, uh, to give you ways to uh, possess them, uh, enjoy them, uh, be uh, puzzled or, or frustrated by them too, uh, to learn something from them, uh, and, and to care about them, uh, and to carry them with you, uh, as you as you go forward uh, after this class. So uh, that's a sense of what I want to uh, accomplish in these lectures. Uh, it will mean reading a lot of poems uh, and writing about them some. Uh, the syllabus, you'll see, notes the general topic of each lecture uh, and the reading that I, I want you to have done for that day. Uh, there's a midterm. Uh, that will be a short answer test that's uh, intended to give you a chance to show how diligently you've been reading and, and coming to class. Uh, the, uh, the final uh, will include both a, a short answer component and then some essay questions. There are two papers, uh, a shorter and a slightly longer one. Uh, the first paper is going to ask you to write about one short poem. Uh, the second will ask you to write about uh, two or more poems, um, or poems perhaps by two authors, or perhaps a poem and some other kind of text or image. Uh, the uh, teaching fellows in this course I'm lucky to work with, and, and you too. Uh, they uh, are trained in, have, have an interest in modern poetry, uh, and, and this is uh, a happy collaboration for me with them. Uh, as I say, we'll start to get our discussion sections organized on Monday, uh, and they should be set, I hope, by the Wednesday lecture next week. Uh, I want you to come to lecture on time. Gee, you all did today. I started on time. I don't always do that, uh, but I'd like to, uh, and I can if you come uh, at 11.30. Bring your books. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the text, and I, I hope you'll have them open. Uh, and, and of course, you will come to your discussion sections in the same state of joyful preparedness. Uh, as I say, the, the syllabus is, uh, should be accessible on the class, class's V2 server. However, I've had problems with that in the past, and you should please let me know <coughs> if it's not. Uh, there are just two books for the course. Uh, they're both at Labyrinth. Uh, one is uh, the first volume of the Norton Anthology of Modern and Contemporary Poetry, third edition. Uh, it's edited by Jahan Ramazani, formerly a teaching fellow in this course. Uh, there's also uh, Elizabeth Bishop's Collected Poems. <coughs> uh, there will be a, a packet that you can order from RIS that uh, uh, gathers a few uh, supplementary readings. Uh, there will be the visual images that I'm going to talk about in lecture uh, and that I will make accessible to you on the classes server. Uh, there are also um, audio recordings of, of the poets that we will be reading that come from Sterling. 
uh, and, and you can get to on the uh, Center for Language Study website. Uh, all those things uh, uh, we can uh, talk about uh, more as the semester develops. Uh, and I hope you will talk to me. Uh, you can uh, do that on email. You can do that uh, in my office, uh, which is downstairs in the first floor of this building in uh, LC 109. Uh, you can uh, catch me after lecture or, or before. Uh, we can have lunch. Uh, all sorts of um, opportunities uh, for talking, and, and uh, I hope you'll take advantage of it. Uh, for Monday, we're going to start talking about Robert Frost, uh, and, and I'd like you to um, uh, pay special attention to his poem, Mowing, in, in the RAS packet. Uh, and to his poem, Birches, in the Norton. Um, as you read, pay uh, special attention to images of tools, work, uh, play. Uh, read Frost's uh, uh, short poetic statement, uh, prose poetic statement, uh, in, the, in the Norton called uh, uh, The Figure a Poem Makes. So. Uh, the Norton Anthology, this book, uh, this heavy book, uh, I, I order it as a, as a way to, um, uh, well, reduce your expenses. Um, here's just one big book to buy. Uh, it also provides needed annotation. Uh, modern poetry is in need of annotation. Uh, this, this new edition of this old book um, is, is an excellent one. Uh, you should read Jahan Ramazani's introduction. Uh, read his prose notes, uh, you know, um, that uh, preface his various selections. Uh, having said that, uh, there's really nothing so dead as a Norton anthology, uh, you know, uh, or, or, or ponderous. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do order it with, with a little, uh, um, well, some misgivings uh, for that. Uh, the poems come to you abstracted from the contexts in which they were originally produced uh, and read, uh, you know, from, from their place in a body of work, in a book, in a magazine, uh, uh, in a life that uh, uh, produced it. Uh, the, um, in order to counteract the kind of packaged and monumental form of, of the Norton, uh, I will be using Beinecke's and, and Sterling's resources uh, using uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, digitized uh, files. Uh, this will uh, allow me to project uh, images uh, in class and for you to look at them later uh, at, at home. Uh, there'll be files for not all, but most of the poets that we uh, discuss. Uh, and the aim is to give you some sense through those images of modern poetry in its historical uh, um, material uh, dimensions, uh, to, to represent it as, as something that was lived uh, and in many ways is living now. <coughs> now, uh, the poems that you'll be reading, we'll be talking about, did not, of course, always exist in the form that you find them. Uh, their first form was very often a manuscript. Uh, if you go to Beinecke, you can, you can find, uh, and we will go to Beinecke, those of you who, who want to come with me, uh, and, and look at uh, uh, manuscripts that were early versions of uh, texts that you uh, now find in the Norton and, and other books. Uh, when poems that had gone through their processes of revision and so forth and came to publication, they very often uh, were published first, uh, not in, in book form certainly, uh, but rather in little magazines uh, that are now more or less lost to us today, but were in fact the uh, essential vehicle for the creation of modern poetry. Uh, what is a little magazine? Uh, it is, um, well, very often they were big, uh, you know, uh, big in, in format uh, and size. Uh, they were little because their circulation was small. Uh, these were the funded on a shoestring 
uh, magazines that uh, uh, rose up and, and very frequently faded away just as quickly uh, in the 1910s and 1920s, uh, and that were in many cases the first avenue of publication for Stevens, Eliot, uh, Moore, uh, the poems, poets that you will be reading in this class. These magazines were uh, acutely uh, aware of their differences from the popular literary magazines of the 19th century. Uh, the general interest uh, popular magazines of the 20th century, uh, magazines with wide circulation, polite audiences. Uh, the little magazine was uh, written to, by, addressed to new young writers and artists, uh, and they were determined to make trouble. They, uh, well, the, the, uh, nothing I, I think captures the nerve of uh, these magazines like the cover of Blast, uh, Blast, which meant kaboom, uh, a magazine as a kind of bomb, uh, a kind of bomb or maybe a curse, damn you, Blast. Uh, Pound was one of the uh, contributors. Uh, Eliot's Rhapsody on a Windy Night uh, appeared here in uh, uh, this number of the magazine uh, from 1915, July 1915, in the midst of the First World War. Uh, let's see. Rogue, another, also from 1915. Notice the price, five cents. Uh, Stevens appeared here in this magazine. You, you could contrast the roguish uh, and fanciful, uh, 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 clearly done by hand title of the magazine with that machine type blast. Uh, uh, both of these are, are, are mischievous, oppositional uh, magazines, uh, but with very different styles and attitudes. Here's another. Broom. Uh, this is a magazine just slightly later. Uh, this is an issue of 1922. Uh, it's a cover by uh, Ferdinand Leger. Hart Crane would appear here. Uh, broom, broom meant to make a clean sweep of things, a uh, clean sweep of what had come before. Uh, it, uh, uh, it also clearly meant to have fun doing it. Uh, here, whoops, let me, uh, I've gone too far. This is the back of the magazine. You can, I don't know how well you can make it out, but there's a, there's a little broom guy there with glasses uh, playing air guitar with his broom. Uh, and, and I guess this is meant to capture the spirit of the contributors. Uh, uh, contrast that with. Well, the magazine that flashed there a moment ago, The Criterion. This is a long way from Broom. Uh, this is October 1922. Uh, comes out just before Broom is created. Uh, here you've got a magazine that doesn't present itself as attacking anything at all, uh, but rather as what? As setting the standard, The Criterion. It looks official, doesn't it? <coughs> uh, the editor is T.S. Eliot. Uh, this is the first number of the magazine. Uh, the magazine, in many ways, announced and facilitated Eliot's rise to a kind of cultural authority as a tastemaker, uh, and with it, uh, certain ideas of modernism. Uh, this uh, issue here, October 1922, includes The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. Uh, it also includes, a little bit further down the page, a review, an essay by Valerie Larbeau on a new novel by James Joyce called Ulysses. Uh, that's some sp uh, sense of the spectrum of, of magazines that are, that are coming out and all with, with uh, uh, different roles to play in this culture and that position their, their writers and poets and artists associated with them in different ways. Book publication can be just as interesting, and it can tell us 
just as much about modern poetry as magazines. This is The Wind Among the Reeds, author William Butler Yeats, uh, the year 1899, on the verge of the new century. It's a beautiful book. It's a book that wants to be beautiful, uh, that's happy to be beautiful. Uh, it's rich in color and texture. Uh, it's designed, embossed, gilt. Uh, it's, well, self-consciously Irish, Celtic. Uh, th th there's a sense that you're supposed to leave the bookstore with a, with a kind of talisman that you, you, have, you, have, you have bought uh, uh, with, a, with uh, a Celtic charm. Contrast this book, <laughs> Proofrock, uh, and other observations. The subtitle left off here of the cover of T.S. Eliot's uh, great book published in 1917. Hmm, this is a different, different object, isn't it? Severe, unsentimental, dry, uh, so much so as to be maybe even a little bit funny. And you laughed, right? Uh, and I think you're supposed to. Uh, it's not entirely serious, uh, even as it declares its seriousness. Uh, if Yeats's book was so uh, explicitly Irish, look at this book. Uh, it has no observable nationality at all, does it? Uh, a certain kind of, well, you might say, uh, impersonality. Uh, its rhetoric is so flat uh, and unemotional, uh, uh, so overtly unrhetorical. Uh, it is, in fact, a very deliberate and self-conscious repudiation of that late romantic aesthetic that Yeats's early book and even the cover of that early book represents. Prufrock isn't beautiful, uh, and its author is not a bard. Another book, another book cover, The Weary Blues by Langston Hughes, 1926. Uh, unlike Prufrock, this one is full of color, uh, and of course it is the work of a poet of color. Uh, the image presents the book not as a uh, work of poetry at all, uh, but rather as a kind of music, uh, as, as a book of blues. Uh, and it associates uh, its poet singer with honky tonk piano players, not Broom's bohemian egghead air guitarist, uh, but uh, another kind of uh, vernacular, uh, another kind of, um, well, celebration and, and um, um, another kind of music makes us think about black artists playing for a living in Prohibition era back rooms. Now, poems, uh, like books, project an image of the poet who produces them. Uh, while the poet is creating her or his poems, the poet uh, is also creating a poet. Uh, a certain figure of the poet, <coughs> a public image of the poet. And this is an evolving project, uh, a, a, a kind of work in progress that's part of the work and part of the subject and part of what I will be talking about here. Let's look, for example, at a series of photos of Ezra Pound. Together they tell a kind of encapsulated history of this central, fascinating, problematic poet's career. Uh, he begins as, well, as an aesthete. <laughs> this is 1913, Pound in London, uh, styling himself, isn't he, uh, after those Renaissance artists and poets uh, whom he would uh, uh, write about, translate uh, in this period. It could be a miniature worn by a Provençal damsel, no? <coughs> well, uh, here he is a little later, Pound after the war um, in uh, uh, 1923, uh, that sort of full flower of modernism. Uh, still a young man, but he's got that cane, uh, and uh, uh, he's in Paris, uh, where, where uh, uh, he would meet. Uh, Eliot and work on the wasteland with him. 
Well, fast forward 20 years. This is Pound, Pound accused of treason. Pound accused of treason of his, by his country, uh, accused of treason as he tries to bend the world to his vision of it. And he escapes trial only by reason of insanity when he is brought from Italy uh, under charges of, of having uh, made broadcasts on fascist radio uh, back to the United States after an ordeal in uh, a cage in uh, Pisa <coughs> where uh, he uh, poses for this photo uh, as uh, an intake photo uh, as he enters St. Elizabeth's Hospital uh, for the Insane in Washington. In this final photo, photo from 1971 back in Italy in Rapallo, uh, well, here's Pound uh, uh, in, uh, presenting us with an image of uh, something that would have seemed impossible when he began, which is an image of modernism grown old, uh, old and, and, and blasted, you know, uh, in many senses. Contrast this, this career. Uh, encapsulated in those images with this one. Who's this? This is uh, the author of Proof Rock. In fact, this is the Harvard student who wrote Proof Rock. I mean, uh, uh, Eliot wrote Proof Rock largely when uh, still at Harvard and in, in the years immediately following. Sexy? Uh, a little, uh, maybe. Uh, those full, slightly parted lips. Uh, <laughs> That windswept hair, the, the General J. Crew look. <coughs> uh, no, notice the handkerchief. Uh, here, here's the editor of, the uh, uh, great editor uh, of, of the publisher uh, Faber and Faber, 30 years later or more, uh, surrounded by books, the cultural arbiter of the English speaking world. T.S. Eliot at 60. Uh, that hair is now slicked down. Uh, there are glasses between him and us. Uh, this is the young man who's become a monument. Uh, but really, the costume is the same one, right? There's the handkerchief. <laughs> Pound's descent into infamy and insanity and indignity and Eliot's rise to the extraordinary cultural power uh, and prestige uh, that he occupied and that is represented by this and many other photos. Well, these are key stories in modern poetry and they're interestingly interlocking just as their two lives were. <coughs> Another modern poet. This is, this is an old woman called Marianne Moore uh, who became a kind of civic icon uh, uh, who became a, a celebrity even uh, as an eccentric New Yorker who wore tri-cornered hats and went to baseball games and the zoo uh, and uh, uh, here uh, appears in, uh, well, her hair braided and wrapped around her head, uh, fanciful, virginal, uh, kindly, safely out of fashion, uh, full of, of a kind of civic virtue, uh, the embodiment of a certain kind of popular idea of poetry. And you, you can't read it, but there's a kind of stamp of approval here from the governor, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, think of how far away this is from Ezra Pound in uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital. This is another image of modern poetry. But uh, Moore's hair was not always done up. Uh, this is the image of a child, uh, also named Marianne Moore, with delicious, prodigious locks. Uh, it it uh, reveals uh, maybe a little bit of the uh, power and extravagance and glory that you feel uh, in her poems, but that she preferred uh, always to uh, restrain and bind and control uh, in uh, extraordinary ways, and not always to hide. Uh, one of the enduring works uh, written in 1922, <coughs> uh, the amazing year that The Wasteland and Ulysses appeared and the Criterion started its publication, one of those amazing works 
uh, is uh, Marianne Moore's poem called Poetry. You've got a, a sample of it on your handout. <coughs> Moore, uh, who revised her poems just the same way she ended up binding her hair, <coughs> uh, republished this poem eventually in short form, uh, very short, uh, where three pages were reduced to two sentences. The first two sentences you see, I too dislike it. There are things important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. Some of what she cut out of the poem, uh, cut out of its later version, uh, is a list of what she had in mind as the genuine, as examples of it, uh, which is the first quotation there, uh, uh, again on your handout. The bat holding on upside down, uh, and so on. Uh, a flea, the baseball fan, the statistician. Nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books. All of these phenomena are important. <laughs> the drive to include the world. Uh, Moore's omnivorous poems claim for poetry all the subjects that she mentions here and indeed many, many more. Uh, all these are new, modern subjects because they represent dimensions of experience formerly excluded from the elevated, idealized discourse that is poetry. Dimensions of experience excluded as prosaic. Moore uh, is quoting here uh, in that phrase, business documents and school books, as she uh, tells us from Tolstoy, a prose writer. Uh, but she goes further than Tolstoy in her commitment to the seemingly non-poetic. She will not only include Tolstoy's prose, she will not even discriminate against business documents and school books. Uh, Moore exemplifies in this way a, a kind of key aspect of modern poetry, its radical heterogeneity, uh, its will to mix many kinds of materials and discourses, uh, to make poetry reach out from the uh, uh, rarefied and limited domain of the poetic to uh, keep including more and more of the world. The next quotation on your handout, this is another example of this, uh, I won't sing for you uh, or, or, or give you my Italian, uh, but these, these famous lines, uh, London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down, and so on, these come from the conclusion to the wasteland. <coughs> they, uh, they thrust together different uh, different texts, different languages, writing from different historical periods, all there compressed in that remarkable uh, mad song that concludes the poem. <coughs> in the next quotation, Eliot tells us that a various and complex civilization such as ours produces, he says, various and complex results, uh, as if inevitably, uh, lest we think that there's anything particularly forced or outlandish or willful uh, about his own uh, 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 remarkable poetry uh, and lines such as those I just quoted for you. Eliot was there in that essay on the metaphysical poets that I'm quoting from, uh, defending as necessary uh, what is the primary characteristic not only of his own poetry but really of modern poetry generally. What is often called its difficulty. Whatever else it may be, everyone's always agreed that modern poetry is difficult. You will probably too. Uh, by difficult, it is meant, I think, well, first of all, that it is in some sense set apart from common speech as a specialized and highly self-conscious use of language. Eliot would go further and say that there is no common form of modern speech, and that's the problem. According to Eliot, the modern world lacks a center, a kind of set of collective beliefs and commitments uh, that would 
enable communication between us. Modernity for Eliot, as for Moore, as for Pound, is marked by a profusion of languages, both national languages such as French or Russian, uh, which turn up in the wasteland, also a bewildering array of specialized types of discourse, technical genres, varieties of speech, business documents, and school books. Just begin uh, this, uh, there's an extraordinary uh, sense of, uh, of verbal uh, chaos, a kind of word hoard that modern poetry and modernism uh, uh, generally, a kind of linguistic environment of great complexity from which uh, modern poetry and modernism emerge. Uh, this is an image uh, called Rotterdam uh, by the uh, artist uh, Edward Wandsworth. It's a woodcut image from Blast. Uh, I like it because it's a kind of image of the modern city that makes the modern city look like language, look like letters, look like a kind of scattered alphabet, a kind of babble. It rep it's, a, it's a kind of picture for me of the linguistic environment, if you will, of modern poetry. Behind this environment are the great social processes of migration and modernization that produced that new urban form, the metropolis. <coughs> All of the poets we read, even that New England hayseed Robert Frost, uh, begin their careers in metropolitan centers primarily in London and New York. All that is solid melts into air, Karl Marx said, uh, evoking the accelerating transformation of modern economic and social life. The metropolis is the center uh, of this unsettled world that Marx describes. Coming to the metropolis a uh, hundred or, or ninety uh, years ago now uh, entailed, for the writers that we'll be reading, uh, as much as for anyone else, a kind of break with a world that they had known, a break either with a native language, this is what the emigrant or the uh, uh, expatriate experiences, or perhaps with native ways of speaking uh, and knowing, uh, familiar spheres of reference. Life in the modern metropolis was defamiliarizing. Uh, it denaturalized language. Uh, where there are many languages in use, well, uh, language comes to seem arbitrary rather than natural, as the product of convention, not as something you're simply born into, but something uh, that you learn, something that is made and that can be remade. Uh, this is a presumption of all the poets we'll be reading. Modern American writers uh, and artists uh, emigrated famously uh, to London, to Paris, uh, another key event in the making of modernism is the great migration of African Americans from the rural South to the urban North. Uh, Langston Hughes's poetry comes out of this experience uh, in the community of black intellectuals and artists it created specifically in Harlem. And you'll see on your handout uh, two quotations from poems by Hughes. Uh, the first, uh, uh, 125th Street, uh, giving us, uh, well, here images of uh, black life in the rural South transposed to Harlem. <coughs> uh, there's a, in those images, I think, a kind of utopian promise that the familiar ordinary pleasures of rural life can be recaptured in a new society of plenty. But there's also something hallucinatory and, and troubling about those images and, and vaguely disturbing uh, that's brought out, I think, in the uh, related uh, famous poem, Harlem, on the uh, next side of the page, where, well, if we've had faces as, as food uh, in, in the first uh, text, um, uh, something possibly reassuring, uh, uh, those faces um, begin to look like dangerous objectifications in the second one, uh, where uh, that raisin in the sun threatens to explode. <coughs> the metropolis is, in modern poetry, uh, set against a backdrop of uh, war and violence uh, and conflict. And uh, modern poetry, as it uh, absorbs the world of the metropolis, absorbs that, uh, that uh, violence and energy uh, as well. Uh, 
the metropolis? Well, it is, it's, a, it's a place of ambivalence, a place of promise and of threat, uh, of exaltation, uh, and also of dread. This ambivalence that I'm describing is, is at the, the center of modern literature generally. <coughs> the metropolis uh, is crowded with language, crowded with faces, uh, but there's also a pervasive sense of absence uh, and of loneliness and of loss captured also, again, paradigmatically in the wasteland. Uh, and I've included uh, there uh, more lines from that poem. The nymphs are departed, Eliot says. Uh, Eliot's speaking of a, a spiritual and imaginative state. Uh, modern poetry arises, in Eliot's case, with the death of God, uh, with the loss of a theological justification for life, with a sense of disenchantment, uh, uh, a sense of depletion, uh, depletion of meaning and value. The metropolis which uproots people, uh, takes them away, takes them out of traditional cultures, also uproots traditional religious belief and practices. Uh, Eliot's poetry, the poetry he created out of this experience, is a poetry of spiritual agony. Modernity is, in his work, uh, a condition of social and psychological fragmentation, which is both, uh, both a private, personal dilemma and, and a public one, as he understands it. Compare to Eliot's city. Uh, Eliot's sense of the city, this one. This is a photograph by Alfred Stieglitz, uh, City of Ambition. <laughs> uh, this is the modern city, not as a scene of fragmentation or despair, uh, but rather a place of ascent and aspiration. It's also a scene of crossings, uh, bridging past and future. This is a photo by another American photographer, Walker Evans, a photo of Brooklyn Bridge. You recognize it. Uh, uh, and here is another, another image uh, by Evans of the bridge. This one comes from a page of Hart Crane's epic poem, The Bridge. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, th a book that you can go find at, at, at Beinecke, a remarkable uh, edition of Crane's poem, uh, where uh, Evan's photos, grand photos, appear as almost miniature images surrounded by white space, uh, as you get some sense in this image. <coughs> in Crane, in his great poem, The Bridge, and here's another photo by Evans, this time of Crane uh, on the rooftop of the apartment building in Brooklyn, 110 Columbia Heights, where he lived and where he began the poem with the bridge in the background. <coughs> uh, in Crane, the emphasis is not on what is lost in modernity, but what is found or what might be. Here's a, a, another quotation from uh, your handout, number seven. New thresholds, new anatomies, wine talons build freedom up about me and distill this competence to travel in a tear sparkling alone within another's will. Modern poetry is difficult, uh, and, and these are difficult lines. New thresholds, new anatomies, well, that's not such a hard concept. That's a, an image of what the modern promises for Crane, and indeed those uh, Gothic arches of the bridge seem to emblematize for him. Uh, yet, Crane's poetry and those lines I just read really are difficult, uh, just as, uh, as Eliot and Pound are difficult, uh, uh, but uh, not because, as in those poets, uh, Crane presents us with obscure references or uh, uh, languages unknown to us um, or learned allusion. Uh, instead, what's difficult in Crane is a kind of compression. Uh, in his writing. Uh, they, they show us a, a poet taking language apart uh, and putting it back together in new ways, uh, new configurations, new anatomies. 
Uh, Crane is full of mixed metaphors. You know, you're not supposed to mix your metaphors. Well, uh, he does all the time. Wine talons, there's one. Wine talons, what are they? Well, uh, think about it. <coughs> uh, uh, perhaps you too have felt wine talons grip you unexpectedly sometime and carry you aloft. The metaphor suggests ecstasy, uh, the exaltation of modern life, that uh, aspiration in, uh, imaged in Stieglitz too. Uh, it suggests that ecstasy is like wine, uh, and wine is like an eagle clasping you. It's prey in its claws. And keep in mind when Crane wrote those lines too, it was illegal to buy and sell wine in this country. <coughs> uh, modernity in, in Crane's strange, gorgeous poetry uh, is all about getting high, about elevation, exaltation. Crane was an alcoholic, and if you study this photo, uh, you, can, you can see the, the uh, uh, qualities uh, uh, um, uh, uh, of a man um, uh, struggling with alcoholism. Uh, this, this friendly and even dignified face uh, has prematurely white hair. Uh, his cheeks are veined. Uh, being drunk became for Crane a kind of grim literalization of the freedom that came with being modern. Uh, and that vision of, of uh, freedom uh, is something that his poetry preserves for us and, and, and carries forward for us and uh, continues to give us as a gift. Contrast his images of joyous or demonic ascent with the images of catastrophe, of descent, uh, of, of collapse in Eliot. London Bridge is falling down. The decay of, of Christian belief and practice uh, is not a, a, a loss, but rather an opportunity for poetry in Crane. Uh, he says uh, in the bridge, uh, uh, he, he asks the bridge to lend a myth to God, uh, and he suggests that this is something that every age must do uh, because our names for God are always metaphors, poems, something imagined, uh, acts of speech. Poet uh, <coughs> Crane shares uh, these general ideas with Wallace Stevens. <laughs> this is Wallace Stevens. Uh, Wallace Stevens who said, poetry is a means of redemption and meant it. Uh, Stevens uh, began life, uh, well, as a choir boy uh, and as a Christian. <coughs> uh, but his work is all about replacing Christian theology with poetry. For Stevens, when modernity takes away God, what it does is unveil the poet's godlike powers, uh, a power to create the world through imagination. Uh, imagination which created God in the first place. In Stevens, uh, modernity shows us that the truth of religion was always a fiction, a fundamentally poetic construction. Stevens' world is secular and non-transcendental, uh, and he is fully at home in it, so much so that uh, he <laughs> lives the life of a uh, bourgeois businessman as uh, an executive of the Hartford Accident and Indemnity uh, Company, <coughs> uh, a great Connecticut burger and poet. Uh, Stevens celebrates the bourgeois world over and over again uh, in a poetry that is about, in itself enacts, uh, our perpetual recreation of reality through the mind and its special medium language. Uh, Stevens, he understands tragedy. Uh, but he is a comic poet, uh, a humanist who is concerned to preserve and exalt the human. Uh, the relativity of truth, the profusion of languages, these things that uh, afflict Eliot uh, are a source of faith for Stevens. Modern poetry seeks absolutes, uh, what Moore calls the genuine, what Crane calls the myth of America, uh, the voice of the thunder in Eliot, uh, Stevens's supreme fiction, 
uh, uh, Pound's Cantos, a poem that would, as he intended, include history. Modern poetry is in all these ways Promethean, astounding, uh, arrogant, uh, enormous, uh, imprudent, visionary. But it also contains other positions, uh, alternatives that, that open those oversized cultural ambitions to critique, uh, to uh, uh, imaginative uh, alternatives of many kinds. And these are suggested, uh, I'll suggest briefly, uh, by the last two poets we'll read. Uh, w. H. Auden, uh, to begin with here, pictured as an Oxford undergraduate, ever cheeky, uh, who has written on the side of his photo, the cerebral life would pay. <coughs> Dry, cool, pragmatic. And Elizabeth Bishop, uh, young in this glamorous George Platt Lyons photo. While modern poetry in many of its forms strives to master reality, Auden reminds us there on your handout cautiously that poetry makes nothing happen. While Stevens represents the poet as a kind of god, Bishop sees the poet rather as a sandpiper, uh, that little bird uh, skittering along the shore, not in control of the world but subject to it, subject to its continual fluctuation and awesome powers. Uh, Bishop Sandpiper Poet there on your, your handout is, is obsessed with the mere details of experience, those sand grains, quartz grains. Uh, her aim is to get along in a world that uh, is dominated by shifting forces that can be registered and reacted to by poetry but not explained. Uh, this is, I think, really also a version of poetic activity uh, that has some sources in and has a lot in common with Robert Frost's, uh, as we will see on Monday. So, thank you.